So welcome everybody. Uh, we're here with Robert Dilt, a leading developer of NLP and also co-writer of the new book, Origins of NLP, uh, co-edited by uh, Frank Fusevich and John Grinder. So Robert, thank you so much for this interview. Um, You're most welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Um, just as a f first question, when you were when you going back to the 1970s, yes, those first moments that you got yeah. into touch with the elements of NLP, what yeah. was it that grasped <laughs> you to, to be in this field? To I can remember, you know, completely vividly. I mean, you know, for for me and, and obviously in my life and my career, I think th that. You know that those first moments, the uh, first moments that I walked into this class that John Grinder was teaching us uh, in linguistics, that was a turning point in my life. Right? I mean, that clearly that's what I, what I've done with my life and what I have you know what I have pursued and what I have become is totally related to that. So that first moment I can definitely you know um, remember very vividly. And you know, first of all. First of all, there was the my, my first connection was with John, mm -hmm. and then then uh, uh, you know some weeks later Richard. Yeah. But I can remember you know uh, as a student walking into this class. There was two hundred other people in this class, you know, and and John Grinder it was unlike any professor I'd ever seen or had before. I mean, so first of all, he was very uh, alive, very dynamic. Um, and, and uh, you know, I remember one of the very first things that he said. To, he said, if there's anybody in this class who is just here because it's a requirement for your school, you know, just come up at the end and I'll sign, I'll sign your papers because I don't, I don't want anybody in here that doesn't want to be in here. Yeah. So, so the, but the message wasn't just, oh, I don't care. You know, it, and on one level, it was like, kind of like uh, there was the message of, you know, I'm not all that. Um, I'm not tied down by bureaucratic, you know, rigidity. But the deeper message was, I want you to be here. You know, I only want you to be here if you want to be here. And I thought, well, that that is nothing you would ever hear from any <laughs> teacher before. It's like yeah. that that was their f primary frame. Yeah. I want you here because you want to be here. And that I mean, so that caught my attention right away. And then, very quickly, I, it was either the first or the second session, he started teaching the pieces of the meta model, you know, that he'd been, you know, and he mentioned Bandler right away. And, uh, you know, it was like the first useful thing I'd ever learned in college, you know, that I could, I mean, that I could actually put into practice right there with, in all parts of my life. <laughs> and it was like, whoa, you know. And this is it was so useful it, it grasped you in that yeah well. it was like wow and also what was very clear I mean the, one thing about the 1970s remember is that they were also a time of a lot of um, change and yeah. and there was a very interesting I'll tell you another very interesting thing that happened then growing up in the United States and especially the San Francisco Bay Area you know where the hippies were and everything that I had noticed the year before that almost the, the way that people got excited about something that what brought people together, what gave people energy up to that time was always this kind of anti-war thing, right? Mm -hmm. So it was a, a, it was a Vietnam period. Mm -hmm. and, and around that time the Vietnam War was ending and it was almost like all this energy that had been there was dissipating. And what happened that was characterized by, I, I think very strongly by, by John and Richard, was suddenly a shift from let's mobilize energy against something to what is possible in the world. Yeah. And you know, 1975 was, and 76 were the same years that Wozniak and Jobs, just 30 minutes away, were starting Apple Computer. Yeah. So it was very clear that this whole other way of looking at things, right, instead of attacking the establishment, because personal computers would yeah. be like, you know, up until that time, computers were like the big brother. And so all, this, all of a sudden, there's this shift in energy yeah. that, wow, we don't have to fight against this. It's not like they're the big brother. We are the ones that can be in charge. Yeah. We can create a different, you know, a different reality, a different yeah. world. And definitely the way that Richard and John were in, in, in those days was this absolute confidence we can change the world, right? Yeah. And that and that uh, you don't need a lot of power, a lot of money. What you needed was, you know, this this way of being able to observe, th th kind of like by. Remember that, like when we first learned about eye accessing cues, we were first yeah. exploring eye accessing cues. 
but the definite feeling was this is going to change the world, you know, yeah. That, yeah. that knowing about that, because it was, it was like stuff that people hadn't ever even paid attention yeah. to before. You know, that with, the, with the meta model and with the Ericsson work, every time something new came up, it was like, this, this will change the yeah. world. I mean, and in many ways, in many ways, it has. You know, yeah. It has. But there was, it was, you know, clearly that, that feeling mm -hmm. that we're on to something big, you know. You were. And we were, you know. We were, I, I can remember, I, I was 19 years old, and I suddenly just, I had this, this vision yeah. that someday I would be teaching this around the world, you know. Maybe, I mean, in those days, it was like, maybe, in, you know, there was still the Iron Curtain, I think, maybe the Soviet Union and in China. And of course, today, I do go to Moscow and I go to China, yeah. you know, so which you in those happen. days, in those days, that would have been, you know. Yeah. You, you can't go, to, you know, nobody went to, yeah. from the United States went to Russia, nobody went to mainland China. So, so it was this, almost like the sense of um, they were kind of directly plugged into the future. Yeah. <laughs> and it was like, and, and to be a young person, you know, to be 19 years old and, and have that sense. You know, and they both had, you know, uh, one of the things that they both had that was very, um, how would I say, you know, very deeply appealing was a, just a great sense of self-confidence that in some cases could, could border on arrogance. But for me, that sense of, of confidence was very, a very powerful influence that was uh, instead of like, oh, I can't do anything or I'm not good enough or I'm not allowed. It was, yes, you can, you know, we, 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 we can do this. And um, so, so very definitely, I mean, from the moment I saw John, and then, you know, as I, I learned about, you know, I mean, again, John Grinder is not your average academic professor. You know, he's John, John Grinder was a ranked tennis player for, for a while. You know, he was very physically fit. I mean, he was a, in the special services, yeah. you know. I mean, yeah. so he's, this guy. is an impressive, you know, yeah. physically impressive, which you don't think of as a college professor, you think of as some kind of a geek, right? <laughs> yeah. Or a nerd, well, that's, so, so it was kind of like, wow, you can be that way and you can be brilliant too, you know, so it's and like... He, and he was also leading with Richard, those practice yeah. groups. Yeah. How did they do that together? So in the is beginning, in the beginning, and it says this, uh, you know, in the, in the uh, or Origins book, Richard and Frank had been doing Gestalt groups mm -hmm. and, you know, Richard um, had gotten into uh, doing Gestalt. My, my understanding, you know, this is, this is what I remember was, because I wasn't there, but Richard, you know, was uh, talking about how in these days therapy was going, coming out, uh, kind of coming out from this world where you had to have a, a, a white coat and be, mm -hmm. you know, some kind of, kind of like the old days of a computer programmer, you know, uh, and it was coming into the world that everybody, you know, it, w it was coming into the kind of public world. And um, there was a guy that wrote a book that, that sort of started to change the whole uh, area of psychotherapy. People like Fritz Perl started doing Gestalt groups and it became more about personal development yeah. than fixing bad symptoms. And so this whole personal development thing was moving. And there was a guy named Steve and sorry, John Stevens that wrote a book called um, Gestalt Therapy Verbatim that changed it because he took people into this work. Now that guy today is, is Steve Andreas. Yes. But he wrote this book that was very famous, and it was about transcripts of what Fritz Perls actually did. So, so there was a publisher that Bandler was working for, just as a student, he was working with his publisher, and he wanted Bandler to edit these manuscripts, uh, the, the, sorry, these videotapes that he had of Perls. So Bandler started doing this thing, and Bandler began to unconsciously model. We always used to say that, that Richard, Richard's modeling strategy was like a sponge. Richard just soaked it up, yeah. including the dirt. <laughs> John was more like a chameleon. Mm -hmm. John turned the color of the background. So, so there's two different strategies. And I think that's, that was a fairly accurate metaphor. And they said that about each other. Um, anyway, Richard started doing these Gestalt groups, and he was doing them with Frank. Yeah. And, and Richard had met John at UCSC once before, and he came back, and uh, there, you know, there's a, some detail of that, but Richard kept trying to get John to come and see what he was doing at these Gestalt groups. Yeah. 
And John, in those days, was kind of more of the radical professor. I mean, I remember the first things I heard you know, about John Grinder was that he would organize the students to lie across the freeway in protest of the Vietnam War. So, mm -hmm. And he'd written a book on Marxist economics. Yeah. And so for him, this personal development stuff was bourgeois, you know, and it was just mm -hmm. people wallowing in their, you know, yeah. their own things. But because Richard is rather persuasive, you know, he finally got John to come and see one of these groups. And John was, you know, John was fascinated and he realized actually what Richard was doing wasn't just kind of enabling and supporting people to yeah. wallow in their bad feelings, but Richard was actually changing people. And John, from his own work, you know, he, he had gone from the special forces uh, to becoming the president of the Communist Party in, in, the, in the SDS, they used to call it Students for a Democratic Society. So he went from one side to the other. But he was always about you know, influencing people and, and, and wanting to make change. And what he saw was that Richard could really make change. So he made this pact with Richard. He said the, kind of these infamous words where he said to Richard, he said, he was impressed and he said, look, if you teach me to do what you're doing, I'll tell you what you're doing. <laughs> and, and it wasn't so much because he was trying to, you know, like it wasn't just, uh, you know, you do this for me and I'll do this for you. It was, he actually later said, he said, well, I, I can't tell you what you're doing until I can do it. Yeah. And I think that's, by the way, one of the essences I think that will come through in the Origins book. Mm -hmm. And that John is very, you know, is to this day very, very, you know, uh, um, strongly, you know, strongly asserts, is that NLP modeling is not I sit back and observe you and describe it. Yeah. It's I can't model unless I can do it first. Yeah, right? You need to fully experience. I I model. So they didn't sit down and and and, and you know. Uh, um, they didn't go down and just, you know, interview Milton Erickson and say, well, Dr. Erickson, what did you do? If you did, I can tell you what Erickson would say anyway, because anytime I asked Erickson a question, you know, like an interview question, mm -hmm. well, Dr. Erickson, what about this or do you do this? He'd always answer the same thing. He'd always go, I don't know, you know, so, <laughs> and this is his most common answer to everything. I don't know, you know, and, and so what you realize is that, A, he wasn't conscious of what he did, but B, he, it wasn't about the explanation of it. Actually, Erickson would always follow this. When we'd ask him a question, you know, should we do this? If, would this work if you do that? He'd always go, I don't know. But he would always follow that with the statement. He'd say, but I'm very curious to discover what is possible. Mm -hmm. yeah. So Erickson's approach was much more don't go from theory I'm going to go from experience. I can't tell you what I'm going to do yeah. until I'm with that client in that experience because I don't, I don't operate from a cognitive conscious theory. I start from experience. Yeah. And that's what Richard and John did. What they would do is they'd go down with Erickson. They wouldn't interview him. They would watch what he did and come back and do it to us. <laughs> we would go in, the groups, in, the in these groups. We'd go to these practice groups and John and Richard would, you know, you'd have, if these were like, like going to the zoo, practically, you know, you'd have people in all kinds of different trance states. And I remember walking in one time, and, and there was this this you know twenty something year old girl crawling on the ground like a baby. I mean, she was basically fully age regressed, like a baby. But the reason they did it is that she wanted to learn another language, and they were saying, well, the best way to learn a language is like a child. Yeah. So by exactly. learning to age regress and go into that state, but you know. So you'd walk in and see that, or there was some other guy that um, he had, he had uh, kind of a, you know, a, a, a deformity in his leg, and they were going to see could they heal that. And so the idea was to disappear his leg and then grow it back again. And so they had this, this whole um, sort of uh, embedded suggestion that at a certain point mm -hmm. they would give a cue and his leg would disappear. And so he, I remember, you know, here's this guy talking with somebody, they give this cue, and suddenly he's going, ah, ah, you know, like falling over because his leg, you know, it was still there, yeah. but it was, you know, in his mind, in his mind it was gone. I mean, so, so there would be these kind of, you know, seemingly, you know, I mean, like if you looked at it, I, you'd think it was a zoo. Now, each of these things wasn't just because they were trying to be like a stage hypnotist, but mm -hmm. each of them had its purpose. But, it was really, I mean, you get the idea, it was very experimental, yeah. 
very experiential and not at all academic, theoretical, analytical. And, and, and I think that what, what is really, I know that both John and Frank and, and all of us were really trying to capture in the Origins book is yeah. the deep experiential nature of, of where NLP comes from. It, today, you know, people teach it as a cognitive, you know, bunch of steps and processes and theories and models, and that is not where it came from. No. It came from have the experience first and then try to find a way to express that so that somebody else can, can get to it quickly. Yes. And what, were, what was the role of both John and Richard and together? What yeah. Well, well, as you kind of get that sense from the beginning, yeah. in the beginning, um, like, uh, as I said, John said, teach me to do what you're doing and I'll tell you what you're doing. So in the beginning, Richard was the doer, right? Richard would do things because he, he you know, John hadn't studied Gestalt or modeled it. Richard had, you know, absorbed it. So Richard could do it, but he didn't know what he was doing. He just did it. You know, he was this amazing, you know, intuitive genius like an Erickson. John had all the academic background, but was, but was a very experiential guy, you know. John, you know, John, for his work in the Special Forces, had to, had to be able to pass as a native speaker of different languages. You know, they, John, John is the kind of guy that they would, you know, they would take John, parachute in the Special Forces, they would parachute him, you know, behind the Iron Curtain. In those yeah. days, that would be like Hungary, so he's parachuted in Hungary, and he'd have to get defectors across the, the border. Yeah. So he'd have to be able to pass you know, he couldn't be American, he had to pass as Hungarian, you know, or German, or Italian. So he had to, to completely, and this is the idea of being the chameleon, right? Yeah. He had to take this on. So he learned to model, you know, when your life depends on yeah, it, yeah. You model it. very clearly. Yeah. He, he also, uh, I remember he was telling me once about where he really learned to hear very, very clearly. He said he had to get across a minefield in Hungary. Mm -hmm. And you can't go in the day and look or you'd get shot. So he'd have to go at night and listen to the patrols walk across. Yeah. He said, you learn to hear really well, <laughs> you know, because your life depends on being able to do that. But then he said to me, he said, but you don't have to have that experience to be able to learn to hear. Yeah. And I think that's the key to modeling, right? John learned it from this very dramatic, you know, experience. But then he said, you can, then, then other people can learn it more quickly. So. But to answer your question, in the, very much in the beginning, we always we used to say, like, Richard is like the right brain, John is the left brain, right? Richard was the doer, John was the modeler. Richard would do it, John would tell, you know, would digitalize it. We yeah. say he's the digital, and John was very much the digitalizer. And then over time, they became more and more balanced, and, and then even at a certain point, they would sort of switch roles. And uh, so, so, Again, uh, very often in the beginning, you know, Richard would do, John would meta comment. You know, he mm -hmm. would, he would point out things, and then they both started doing it. And, and of course, that's part of any yeah. any good partnership is they, they, um, you know, each each were able to eventually yeah. do and both. And this is how you got the full range of learning yeah. as well, right brain as left brain. Yeah. You got it all in yeah. the package. Yeah. yeah. And by the way, I think this, here's the other part of that metaphor. There's right brain, left brain, but what do the brains do? There's the experience of the body. <laughs> you know, so that was the common thing, doing, and then you have, it, so it's not, again, it's really important, it's not coming from here, mm -hmm. it's coming from here, yeah. but this, the value of this is then you know what you're doing and you can, you can communicate it, you can pass it on, yeah. um, and that's what they did with Erickson, you know, yeah. is, is Erickson was a, a doer, that, but he wasn't a teacher, right? He wasn't yeah. a modeler. So they could engage that by, by modeling him, which was not analyzing him, right? But by absorbing it, doing it with us, then they could go, here, here, are, the, here are the steps. Yeah. And you know, their way of teaching us is, you know, John, they would do something with somebody and then John would point to me and point to somebody else, send us into a room and you know, I would go do, you know, do it. Yeah. And, um, you know, so it was, a, it was a very, again, you know, completely what, what you would call heuristic form of learning. Ex yeah. Experience first, learn in contexts, learn by doing. Yeah.